Chapter Ten and Eleven of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen hundred and eighty-seven, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter Ten. If I'm going to explain our way of shopping to you, said my companion as we walked along the street, you must explain your way to me. I have never been able to understand it from all I have read on the subject. For example. When you had such a vast number of shops, each with its different assortment, how could a lady ever settle upon any purchase till she had visited all the shops? For, until she had, she could not know what there was to choose from. It was as you suppose, that was the only way she could know, I replied. Father calls me an indefatigable shopper, but I should soon be a very fatigued one if I had to do as they did, was Edith's laughing comment. The loss of time in going from shop to shop was indeed a waste which the busy bitterly complained of, I said. But as for the ladies of the idle class, though they complained also, I think the system was really a godsend by furnishing a device to kill time. But say there were a thousand shops in a city, hundreds perhaps of the same sort, how could even the idlest find time to make their rounds? They really could not visit all, of course, I replied. Those who did a great deal of buying learned in time where they might expect to find what they wanted. This class had made a science of the specialties of the shops, and bought at advantage, always getting the most and best for the least money. It required, however, long experience to acquire this knowledge. Those who were too busy, or bought too little to gain it, took their chances and were generally unfortunate, getting the least and worst for the most money. It was the merest chance if persons not experienced in shopping received the value of their money. But why did you put up with such a shockingly inconvenient arrangement when you saw its faults so plainly? Edith asked me. It was like all our social arrangements, I replied. You can see their faults scarcely more plainly than we did, but we saw no remedy for them. Here we are at the store of our ward, said Edith as we turned in at the great portal of one of the magnificent public buildings I had observed in my morning walk. There was nothing in the exterior aspect of the edifice to suggest a store to a representative of the nineteenth century. There was no display of goods in the great windows, or any device to advertise wares or attract custom. Nor was there any sort of sign or legend on the front of the building to indicate the character of the business carried on there. But instead, above the portal, standing out from the front of the building, a majestic life-size group of statuary, the central figure of which was a female ideal of plenty, with her cornucopia. Judging from the composition of the throng passing in and out, about the same proportion of the sexes among shoppers obtained as in the nineteenth century. As we entered, Edith said that there was one of these great distributing establishments in each ward of the city, so that no residence was more than five or ten minutes' walk from one of them. It was the first interior of a twentieth-century public building that I had ever beheld, and the spectacle naturally impressed me deeply. I was in a vast hall full of light, received not only from the windows on all sides, but from the dome, the point of which was a hundred feet above. Beneath it, in the centre of the hall, a magnificent fountain played, cooling the atmosphere to a delicious freshness with its spray. The walls and ceiling were frescoed in mellow tints calculated to soften without absorbing the light which flooded the interior. Around the fountain was a space occupied with chairs and sofas, on which many persons were seated conversing. Legends on the walls all about the hall indicated to what classes of commodities the counters below were devoted. Edith directed her steps towards one of these, where samples of muslin of a bewildering variety were displayed, and proceeded to inspect them. "'Where is the clerk?' I asked for there was no one behind the counter, and no one seemed coming to attend to the customer. "'I have no need of the clerk yet,' said Edith. "'I have not made my selection.' "'It was the principal business of clerks to help people to make their selections in my day,' I replied. "'What? To tell people what they wanted?' "'Yes, and oftener to induce them to buy what they didn't want.' "'But did not ladies find that very impertinent?' Edith asked, wonderingly. What concern could it possibly be to the clerks whether people bought or not? It was their sole concern, I answered. They were hired for the purpose of getting rid of the goods, and were expected to do their utmost, short of the use of force, to compass that end. Ah, yes, how stupid I am to forget, said Edith. 
the storekeeper and his clerks depended for their livelihood on selling the goods in your day. Of course, that is all different now. The goods are the nation's. They are here for those who want them, and it is the business of the clerks to wait on people and take their orders. But it is not the interest of the clerk or the nation to dispose of a yard or a pound of anything to anybody who does not want it. She smiled as she added, How exceedingly odd it must have seemed to have clerks trying to induce one to take what one did not want or was doubtful about. But even a twentieth-century clerk might make himself useful in giving you information about the goods, though he did not tease you to buy them, I suggested. No, said Edith, that is not the business of the clerk. These printed cards, for which the government authorities are responsible, give us all the information we can possibly need. I saw then that there was fastened to each sample a card containing in succinct form a complete statement of the make and materials of the goods and all its qualities, as well as price, leaving absolutely no point to hang a question on. The clerk has, then, nothing to say about the goods he sells? I said. Nothing at all. It is not necessary that he should know or profess to know anything about them. Courtesy and accuracy in taking orders are all that are required of him. "'What a prodigious amount of lying that simple arrangement saves!' I ejaculated. "'Do you mean that all the clerks misrepresented their goods in your day?' Edith asked. "'God forbid that I should say so,' I replied, for there were many who did not, and they were entitled to a special credit, for when one's livelihood and that of his wife and babies depended on the amount of goods he could dispose of, the temptation to deceive the customer, or let him deceive himself, was well-nigh overwhelming. But, Miss Leed, I am distracting you from your task with my talk. Not at all. I have made my selections. With that she touched a button, and in a moment a clerk appeared. He took down her order on a tablet with a pencil which made two copies, of which he gave one to her, and, enclosing the counterpart in a small receptacle, dropped it into a transmitting tube. The duplicate of the order, said Edith, as she turned away from the counter, after the clerk had punched the value of her purchase out of the credit card she gave him, is given to the purchaser, so that any mistakes in filling it can be easily traced and rectified. "'You were very quick about your selections,' I said. "'May I ask how you knew that you might not have found something to suit you better in some of the other stores? But probably you are required to buy in your own district.' "'Oh, no,' she replied. "'We buy where we please, though naturally most often near home.' But I should have gained nothing by visiting other stores. The assortment in all is exactly the same, representing as it does, in each case, samples of all the varieties produced or imported by the United States. That is why one can decide quickly, and never need visit two stores. And is this merely a sample store? I see no clerks cutting off goods or marking bundles. All our stores are sample stores, except as to a few classes of articles. The goods with these exceptions, are all at the great central warehouse of the city, to which they are shipped directly from the producers. We order from the sample and the printed statement of texture, make, and qualities. The orders are sent to the warehouse, and the goods distributed from there. That must be a tremendous saving of handling, I said. By our system, the manufacturer is sold to the wholesaler, the wholesaler to the retailer, and the retailer to the consumer, and the goods had to be handled each time. You avoid one handling of the goods, and eliminate the retailer altogether, with his big profit and the army of clerks it goes to support. Why, Miss Leed, this store is merely the order department of a wholesale house, with no more than a wholesaler's complement of clerks. Under our system of handling the goods, persuading the customer to buy them, cutting them off, and packing them, ten clerks would not do what one does here. The saving must be enormous. I suppose so, said Edith. But, of course, we have never known any other way. But, Mr. West, you must not fail to ask Father to take you to the central warehouse some day, where they receive the orders from the different sample houses all over the city, and parcel out and send the goods to their destinations. He took me there not long ago, and it was a wonderful sight. The system is certainly perfect. For example, over yonder in that sort of cage is the dispatching clerk. The orders, as they are taken by the different departments in the store, are sent by transmitters to him. His assistants sort them and enclose each class in a carrier box by itself. The dispatching clerk has a dozen pneumatic transmitters before him answering to the general classes of goods, 
each communicating with a corresponding department at the warehouse. He drops the box of orders into the tube it calls for, and a few moments later it drops on the proper desk in the warehouse, together with all the orders of the same sort from the other sample stores. The orders are read off, recorded, and sent to be filled like lightning. The filling I thought the most interesting part. Bales of cloth are placed on spindles and turned by machinery, and the cutter, who also has a machine, works right through one bale after another till exhausted, when another man takes his place and it is the same with those who fill the orders in any other staple. The packages are then delivered by larger tubes to the city districts, and thence distributed to the houses. You may understand how quickly it is all done, when I tell you that my order will probably be at home sooner than I could have carried it from here." "'How do you manage in the thinly settled rural districts?' I asked. "'The system is the same,' Edith explained. The village sample shops are connected by transmitters with the central county warehouse, which may be twenty miles away. The transmission is so swift, though, that the time lost on the way is trifling. But to save expense, in many counties one set of tubes connects several villages with the warehouse, and then there is time lost waiting for one another. Sometimes it is two or three hours before goods ordered are received. It was so where I was staying last summer, and I found it quite inconvenient. Footnote. I am informed, since the above is in type, that this lack of perfection in the distributing service of some of the country districts is to be remedied, and that soon every village will have its own set of tubes. End footnote. There must be many other respects also, no doubt, in which the country stores are inferior to the city stores, I suggested. No, Edith answered. They are otherwise precisely as good. The sample shop of the smallest village just like this one, gives you your choice of all the varieties of goods the nation has, for the county warehouse draws on the same source as the city warehouse. As we walked home I commented on the great variety in the size and cost of the houses. How is it, I asked, that this difference is consistent with the fact that all citizens have the same income? Because, Edith explained, although the income is the same, personal taste determines how the individual shall spend it. Some like fine horses, others, like myself, prefer pretty clothes, and still others want an elaborate table. The rents which the nation receives for these houses vary according to size, elegance, and location, so that everybody can find something to suit. The larger houses are usually occupied by large families, in which there are several to contribute to the rent, while small families, like ours, find smaller houses more convenient and economical. It is a matter of taste and convenience wholly. I have read that in old times people often kept up establishments and did other things which they could not afford for ostentation, to make people think them richer than they were. Was it really so, Mr. West? I shall have to admit that it was, I replied. Well, you see, it could not be so nowadays, for everybody's income is known, and it is known that what is spent one way must be saved another. CHAPTER Eleven. When we arrived home, Dr. Leith had not yet returned, and Mrs. Leith was not visible. "'Are you fond of music, Mr. West?' Edith asked. I assured her that it was half of life, according to my notion. "'I ought to apologize for inquiring,' she said. "'It is not a question that we ask one another nowadays. But I have read that in your day, even among the cultured class, there were some who did not care for music.' "'You must remember, in excuse,' I said that we had some rather absurd kinds of music. Yes, she said, I know that. I am afraid I should not have fancied it all myself. Would you like to hear some of ours now, Mr. West? Nothing would delight me so much as to listen to you, I said. To me, she exclaimed, laughing. Did you think I was going to play or sing to you? I hoped so, certainly, I replied. Seeing that I was a little abashed, she subdued her merriment and explained, of course, we all sing nowadays, as a matter of course, in the training of the voice, and some learn to play instruments for their private amusement, but the professional music is so much grander and more perfect than any performance of ours, and so easily commanded when we wish to hear it, that we don't think of calling our singing or playing music at all. All the really fine singers and players are in the musical service, and the rest of us hold our peace for the main part. But would you really like to hear some music? 
I assured her once more that I would. "'Come then into the music-room,' she said, and I followed her into an apartment, finished, without hangings, in wood, with a floor of polished wood. I was prepared for new devices in musical instruments, but I saw nothing in the room which by any stretch of imagination could be conceived as such. It was evident that my puzzled appearance was affording intense amusement to Edith. "'Please look at today's music,' she said, handing me a card, "'and tell me what you would prefer. It is now five o'clock, you will remember.' The card bore the date, September 12, 2000, and contained the longest programme of music I had ever seen. It was as various as it was long, including a most extraordinary range of vocal and instrumental solos, duets, quartets, and various orchestral combinations. I remained bewildered by the prodigious list until Edith's pink fingertip indicated a particular section of it, where several selections were bracketed, with the words 5 p.m. against them. Then I observed that this prodigious programme was an all-day one, divided into twenty-four sections answering to the hours. There were but a few pieces of music in the 5 p.m. section, and I indicated an organ piece as my preference. "'I am so glad you like the organ,' said she. "'I think there is scarcely any music that suits my mood oftener.' She made me sit down comfortably, and, crossing the room, so far as I could see, merely touched one or two screws and at once the room was filled with the music of a grand organ anthem. Filled, not flooded, for, by some means, the volume of melody had been perfectly graduated to the size of the apartment. I listened, scarcely breathing, to the close. Such music, so perfectly rendered, I had never expected to hear. Grand! I cried, as the last great wave of sound broke and ebbed away into silence. Bach must be at the keys of that organ. But where is the organ? "'Wait a moment, please,' said Edith. "'I want to have you listen to this waltz before you ask any questions. I think it is perfectly charming.' And as she spoke the sound of violins filled the room with the witchery of a summer night. When this had also ceased, she said, "'There is nothing in the least mysterious about the music, as you seem to imagine. It is not made by fairies or genii, but by good, honest, and exceedingly clever human hands.' We have simply carried the idea of labour-saving, by cooperation, into our musical service as into everything else. There are a number of music-rooms in the city, perfectly adapted, acoustically, to the different sorts of music. These halls are connected by telephone with all the houses of the city whose people care to pay the small fee, and there are none, you may be sure, who do not. The corps of musicians attached to each hall is so large that, although no individual performer or group of performers has more than a brief part, each day's programme lasts through the twenty-four hours. There are on that card for today, as you will see if you observe closely, distinct programmes of four of these concerts, each of a different order of music from the others, being now simultaneously performed, and any one of the four pieces now going on that you prefer, you can hear by merely pressing the button which will connect your house wire with the hall where it is being rendered. The programmes are so coordinated that the pieces at any one time simultaneously proceeding in the different halls usually offer a choice, not only between instrumental and vocal, and between different sorts of instruments, but also between different motives, from grave to gay, so that all tastes and moods can be suited. "'It appears to me, Miss Leet,' I said, "'that if we could have devised an arrangement for providing everybody with music in their homes, perfect in quality,' unlimited in quantity, suited to every mood, and beginning and ceasing at will, we should have considered the limit of human felicity already attained, and ceased to strive for further improvements. I am sure I never could imagine how those among you who depended at all on music managed to endure the old-fashioned system for providing it, replied Edith. Music really worth hearing must have been, I suppose, wholly out of the reach of the masses, and attainable by the most favoured only occasionally, at great trouble, prodigious expense, and then for brief periods, arbitrarily fixed by somebody else, and in connection with all sorts of undesirable circumstances. Your concerts, for instance, and operas! How perfectly exasperating it must have been, for the sake of a piece or two of music that suited you, to have to sit for hours listening to what you did not care for! Now, at a dinner one can skip the courses one does not care for, who would ever dine, however hungry, if required to eat everything brought on the table? 
and I'm sure one's hearing is quite as sensitive as one's taste. I suppose it was these difficulties in the way of commanding really good music which made you endure so much playing and singing in your homes by people who had only the rudiments of the art. Yes, I replied, it was that sort of music, or none, for most of us. Ah, well, Edith sighed. When one really considers, it is not so strange that people in those days so often did not care for music. I dare say I should have detested it too. Did I understand you rightly, I inquired, that this musical program covers the entire twenty-four hours? It seems to on this card, certainly. But who is there to listen to music between, say, midnight and morning? Oh, many, Edith replied. Our people keep all hours. But if the music were provided from midnight to morning for no others, it still would be for the sleepless, the sick, and the dying. All our bedchambers have a telephone attachment at the head of the bed by which any person who may be sleepless can command music at pleasure, of the sort suited to the mood. Is there such an arrangement in the room assigned to me? Why, certainly! And how stupid, how very stupid of me, not to think to tell you of that last night! Father will show you about the adjustment before you go to bed to-night, however, and with the receiver at your ear I am quite sure you will be able to snap your fingers at all sorts of uncanny feelings if they trouble you again. That evening Dr. Leed asked us about our visit to the stall, and in the course of the desultory comparison of the ways of the nineteenth century and the twentieth, which followed, something raised the question of inheritance. "'I suppose,' I said, "'the inheritance of property is not now allowed.' "'On the contrary,' replied Dr. Leed. There is no interference with it. In fact, you will find, Mr. West, as you come to know us, that there is far less interference of any sort with personal liberty nowadays than you were accustomed to. We require, indeed, by law, that every man shall serve the nation for a fixed period, instead of leaving him his choice, as you did, between working, stealing, or starving. With the exception of this fundamental law, which is, indeed, merely a codification of the law of nature, the Edict of Eden, by which it is made equal in its pressure on men, our system depends in no particular upon legislation, but is entirely voluntary, the logical outcome of the operation of human nature under rational conditions. This question of inheritance illustrates just that point. The fact that the nation is the sole capitalist and landowner, of course, restricts the individual's possessions to his annual credit, and what personal and household belongings he may have procured with it. His credit, like an annuity in your day, seizes on his death, with the allowance of a fixed sum for funeral expenses. His other possessions he leaves as he pleases. What is to prevent, in course of time, such accumulations of valuable goods and chattels in the hands of individuals as might seriously interfere with equality in the circumstances of citizens? I asked. That matter arranges itself very simply, was the reply. Under the present organization of society, Accumulations of personal property are merely burdensome the moment they exceed what adds to the real comfort. In your day, if a man had a house crammed full with gold and silver plate, rare china, expensive furniture, and such things, he was considered rich, for these things represented money, and could at any time be turned into it. Nowadays, a man whom the legacies of a hundred relatives simultaneously dying should place in a similar position would be considered very unlucky. The articles, not being saleable, would be of no value to him, except for their actual use, or the enjoyment of their beauty. On the other hand, his income remaining the same, he would have to deplete his credit to hire houses to store the goods in, and still further to pay for the service of those who took care of them. You may be very sure that such a man would lose no time in scattering among his friends possessions which only made him the poorer and that none of those friends would accept more of them than they could easily spare room for and time to attend to. You see, then, that to prohibit the inheritance of personal property with a view to prevent great accumulations would be a superfluous precaution for the nation. The individual citizen can be trusted to see that he is not overburdened. So careful is he in this respect that the relatives usually waive claim to most of the effects of deceased friends, reserving only particular objects. The nation takes charge of the resigned chattels, and turns such as are of value into the common stock once more. "'You spoke of paying for service to take care of your houses,' said I. "'That suggests a question I have several times been on the point of asking. 
how have you disposed of the problem of domestic service? Who are willing to be domestic servants in a community where all are social equals? Our ladies found it hard enough to find such even when there was little pretense of social equality. It is precisely because we are all social equals whose equality nothing can compromise, and because service is honourable, in a society whose fundamental principle is that all in turn shall serve the rest, that we could easily provide a corps of domestic servants such as you never dreamt of, if we needed them, replied Dr. Leed. But we do not need them. Who does your housework, then? I asked. There is none to do, said Mrs. Leed, to whom I had addressed this question. Our washing is all done at public laundries at excessively cheap rates, and our cooking at public kitchens. The making and repairing of all we wear are done outside, in public shops. Electricity, of course, takes the place of all fires and lighting. We choose houses no larger than we need, and furnish them so as to involve the minimum of trouble to keep them in order. We have no use for domestic servants." The fact, said Dr. Leed, that you had in the poorer classes a boundless supply of serfs on whom you could impose all sorts of painful and disagreeable tasks, made you indifferent to devices to avoid the necessity for them. But now that we all have to do in turn whatever work is done for society, every individual in the nation has the same interest, and a personal one, in devices for lightening the burden. This fact has given a prodigious impulse to labour-saving inventions in all sorts of industry, of which the combination of the maximum of comfort and minimum of trouble in household arrangements was one of the earliest results. In case of special emergencies in the household, pursued Dr. Leed, such as extensive cleaning or renovation, or sickness in the family, we can always secure assistance from the industrial force. But how do you recompense these assistants, since you have no money? We do not pay them, of course, but the nation for them. Their services can be obtained by application at the proper bureau, and their value is pricked off the credit card of the applicant. What a paradise for womankind the world must be now, I exclaimed. In my day, even wealth and unlimited servants did not enfranchise their possessors from household cares, while the women of the merely well-to-do and poorer classes lived and died martyrs to them. Yes, said Mrs. Leed, I have read something of that, enough to convince me that, badly off as the men, too, were in your day, they were more fortunate than their mothers and wives. The broad shoulders of the nation, said Dr. Leed, bear now like a feather the burden that broke the backs of the women of your day. Their misery came, with all your other miseries, from that incapacity for cooperation which followed from the individualism on which your social system was founded, from your inability to perceive that you could make ten times more profit out of your fellow men by uniting with them than by contending with them. The wonder is, not that you did not live comfortably, but that you were able to live together at all, who were all confessedly bent on making one another your servants, and securing possession of one another's goods. "'There, there, father, if you are so vehement, Mr. West will think you are scolding him,' laughingly interposed Edith. "'When you want a doctor,' I asked, "'do you simply apply to the proper bureau, and take any one that may be sent?' "'That rule would not work well in the case of physicians,' replied Dr. Leed. The good a physician can do a patient depends largely on his acquaintance with his constitutional tendencies and conditions. The patient must be able, therefore, to call in a particular doctor, and he does so just as patients did in your day. The only difference is that, instead of collecting his fee for himself, the doctor collects it for the nation, by pricking off the amount, according to a regular scale for medical attendance, from the patient's credit card. "'I can imagine,' I said, "'that if the fee is always the same, and a doctor may not turn away patients, as I suppose he may not, the good doctors are called constantly, and the poor doctors left in idleness. In the first place, if you will overlook the apparent conceit of the remark from a retired physician, replied Dr. Leed with a smile, we have no poor doctors. Anybody who pleases to get a little smattering of medical terms is not now at liberty to practice on the bodies of citizens, as in your day. None but students who have passed the severe tests of the schools, and clearly proved their vocation, are permitted to practice. Then, too, you will observe that there is nowadays no attempt of doctors to build up their practice at the expense of other doctors. There would be no motive for that. For the rest, the doctor has to render regular reports of his work to the medical bureau, and, if he is not reasonably well employed, 
work is found for him. End of chapter 11